tell you a story. I hope Rabbi Mizrahi Shehichia doesn't get upset at me. But this, you have to see Puget Tzadikim. You hear these stories sometimes, you don't realize who you're standing next to until you hear these stories about them. Now most of the stories with Rabbi Ephraim that I'm telling you, I saw with my own eyes. If I didn't see with my own eyes, I wouldn't believe it. But I spent a lot of time with Rabbi Ephraim. I didn't spend as much time with Rabbi Mizrahi, but I talked to him, Baruch Hashem, for years now, all, you know, all the time. We work together all the time with different things, but anytime I find another chidush about his life, for me, it's like a million dollars. But people don't understand. They don't understand what it means to dedicate a quarter of a century to Am Yisrael. They don't understand what it means. They think he just comes... And you do, you talk to a few people, and it's fun, and people say, Chazaku Baruch, and maybe a few, a few people give you 20 bucks, and one guy gives you 100, and then you go home, and like, oh, thank you, and your life is normal like everybody else, and you go, and you eat, and you have a... That's what people think. People think you have a normal life. The last thing you have is normal. When you do Kiru Fahami Yisrael, there's nothing normal about your life. When you send a text message to a rabbi at 3.30 in the morning and he answers, it's not because you woke him up. It's because he doesn't sleep. It's not because he has nothing to do. It's because he has too much to do. But you see, before I started doing Kiruv myself, as far as speaking, I was doing Kiruv differently. I was giving people books and CDs and packages. I was publicizing Rabbi Ephraim Shurim on the internet. And I used to listen to three, four, five lectures of Rabbi Zrachi every day. Oh, it's like clockwork. It was always on. It was always nothing. It was constantly writing notes, constantly learning. Rabbi Zrachi, Rabbi Ephraim. It was nonstop. But I never really appreciated him as much as I did after I started speaking to people. And most people that listened to him, and they said, no, I'm his biggest fan. Oh, I love him. Oh, I listened to all of his shurim. Trust me when I tell you, you have no idea who you're dealing with. You have no idea who you're dealing with. Because what you see is like a movie. It's like an illusion. It's like you think you know the celebrity because you saw him in a movie, and maybe you saw him at a restaurant. You said hello, and he gave you an autograph. The stories that nobody hears are the stories of their life. And Mamash Rabotai, I heard this story. To me, this is, just gives you a little bit of a small perspective. I mean, everybody knows what happened after the whole balagan that happened with the Holocaust. Comments that were mistranslated and manipulated. He didn't care about the fact that he was right. He cared about the fact that people thought he was wrong. Where he went to the Holocaust survivor, kissed his hand. No matter if people are taping it, it's going to go all over the internet. You're taping some old man, you're kissing his hand. Who is he, Bichlal? What do you mean? It's a Judy, Judy Kadosh. He's a holy Jew. I don't want him to be offended. Yeah, but he doesn't know you. It doesn't make a difference. Meaning that the, the, the significance of how you view every Jew, you look at them as like, Mama, this is the most prized thing in the world. So when I was in Canada, after one of the shiurim, we stuck around for a little while talking questions and answers, private stuff of some people. And then a group of people stuck around and were talking. And uh, Rabbi Mizrahi came up and he told me a story I never heard. He told me a story that nobody ever heard. Probably his family, maybe, people that were there. Aside from that, nobody else. Why? Because I heard a lot of his shurim. It's not on the shurim. This is one of those stories that I, if I don't say it, you're never going to know it. But I have to say it. I have to say it. Why? You have to understand who you're dealing with. The kavod for chachamim is so important that people treat him like he's some regular rabbi, like he's some local Chabad rabbi or Breslev rabbi or Orthodox, uh, modern Orthodox rabbi that just comes to shul, prays with you a few times, give you a two-minute shul between Mincha and Alvit and uh, Chazaku Baruch. I'll see you on Shabbos. People think this is a regular person. A few years ago, I think it was the first time maybe he was invited over there, Hashem gave him a test. I know for sure. I'm not telling you I don't want. I know for sure I would have failed miserably. Like I'm telling you now. All right, I failed. I failed the test. Even in imagination, I failed. Not even in my imagination, I passed. You know, in imagination, you're like a Superman. You're like Superman in the imagination. I'm telling you, I failed. So he went to Montreal. 
he had a big Shabbaton set up. Big Shabbaton, lots of people were supposed to come. But Hashem wanted to give him a test. Ooh, wow, ooh, wow, what a test. Literally like a day or so before he came, some lefty liberal Rasha Merusha went to the media and said, we have a new report. What's new report? Religious extremism coming to Canada. What? So they highlight five people. Four Muslims that are on a terror watch list and Rav Mizrahi. One of the biggest tzaddikim in our generation is being put next to murderers, rapists, killers. He's on the same network. Now the fools over there, they don't know who Rav Mizrahi is because oh, some people just are like living under a rock for the last 25 years. So they say, oh no, no, he's here already? Oh no, we're not going to have the Shabbaton. What do you mean not going to have the Shabbaton? He's here, there's uh, hundreds of people waiting. There's, there's a bunch of people waiting. They want to come. No, no, we can't. It's a shul. It's to this. We can't. We don't want the media to come. What media to come? It's Shabbat. No one media is coming to you. No, we don't want the attention. I don't know. Ah, ah. He's already over there. Everything is already set up. The CDs are there. He's there. People are there. People are ready. People... The Beknesset does not want to even rent them the place. Now I'm telling you personally, at that moment, I said, you don't want me? No problem. The plane is right behind. See ya! <laughs> See ya! Thank you! What do I care? You don't want to have me? No, thank you. Well, who's losing out? Me or you? I have information you need. You don't like it? See you. What's the problem? That's the mentality of a fool like me. Why? Because what did he do? He's saying there are Jews here that need information to do tshuva. What difference does it make if there's a shul or not? Find me a floor. And I'll lecture on the floor with everybody. I'll sit on the floor with everybody. The whole Shabbat, they're sitting on the floor in the kitchen. Of this guy that told me the story was his kitchen. It's not like a third-hand story. The guy's kitchen, he's telling me the story was we were all on the floor. Th there was no place to move. Everybody's sitting on the floor. Rabbi Zachi's with us on the floor. We're learning the whole Shabbat. Everybody did you the walls did tshuva. The kitchen did tshuva. Now he has a bigger house, Baruch Hashem. Why? You care about Am Yisrael. You care about Torah. You don't care about, oh, no kavod. They're not giving me the respect I deserve. I'm already in this 20 years. Ah, what kavod? What kavod? What, what, what? Nobody owes me anything. I have a merit to go help some people do tshuva. Baruch Hashem. What kavod? Who wants kavod? Why would I ever want kavod? You guys think, you see in elections, he says, no, don't be, a, don't be a gaftan, don't be a, you know, be humble, be humble. And you think, no, he's just saying it. Butai Karim, you can't just say it. It's either you live it or you don't. The average person that literally just graduated rabbinical school, 24 years old, was still a little bit of you, uh, you know, needs the tissue to constantly follow him to clean his nose. He still doesn't know how to clean his own nose yet. He goes to a place, if they don't pay him at least a thousand dollars to speak, he's not coming. Nobody speaks for free. If you're not paying him a thousand dollars, he's not coming. If you're a speaker for 20 years, minimum is five, ten, twenty thousand dollars. Depends how big and what type of speaker you are. Some speakers get hundreds of thousands, but the worst speaker in the world, the guy that just started last week, he gets a thousand dollars for an hour. Plane ticket, hotel, five stars, meals, this. By the time he left on the weekend, you spend at least 10 grand for the worst guy. You're going there for free. And on top of it, they embarrass you by canceling an event and not even allowing you to rent a place. Forget it if you don't want me. Okay, I'll rent it. I'll rent it. I'll, we'll enter from the back so no one sees us. No, no, we want no association. Okay, we have no association. No one else wants association. No one else wants to do anything else. Do we have a floor? Do we have four walls? Okay, that's enough. But where about the kavod? What kavod? Who said I need kavod? Who said I need kavod to do kiruv? All I need is Jews. Kavod? I, hopefully I don't get it. That's what the tzaddik says. You watch lectures, like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he's nice. I like the way he talks. Well, I like the way he talks. 
People have no idea what you're dealing with. Baruch Hashem, we have the merit. We have the merit to have such a tzaddik in our generation. I know, hopefully he doesn't get upset at me for telling people about his sipure tzaddikim. But people need to know who you're dealing with. You're watching shiurim of someone that sacrificed a quarter of a century of his life. You have no right to ask any questions that, oh, what, what, what does he think of this? But maybe he made a mistake of this. People have sacrificed their life for Am Yisrael to do something that most people can't do. They deserve much more than what they're getting. His wife, who, wah, I wish I have uh, the Allah above her shoes. Just if I get the Allah above just where her shoes are, I'll be fine. Someone sacrifices a woman, sacrifices a husband for 25 years? doesn't get better than that. This is what we have to understand. There are some people that are popular. There are some people that are very charismatic when they speak. But when the words come out of their mouth, it's all nonsense. It's all shtuyot. Why? Because they like the bank a lot more than they like the people. But when you have somebody that's been giving the truth to Am Yisrael, the uncensored truth for 25 years, it's time we understand what it means. It's time we understand how to honor these people, how to give the kavod for their Torah, for their mesirut nefesh. This is not a regular rabbi. These are not regular people. These are people that are sacrificing themselves for nothing, for free. For free. Oh, Hashem, Hashem provides. But the point is, Rabotai, is that you need to know that when you're learning Torah from one person that just got paid $10,000 to come, and another person that's not getting paid, it's a different type of Torah. It's a different type of Torah. One person tells you the truth, the other one tells you what you want to hear. It's a different Torah altogether. It's a different religion. It's a different religion. So here we see that even if you got to the level of, of Mizrahi, you're still not allowed to ask for Gedula. You're still not allowed to chamot the chamot kavod. You still have to do your termi limudecha. You still have to constantly do tshuva. So if somebody like this has to do tshuva, what about us? What about us?